Greetings, everyone. This is Stephen Gray here. This is, you are either watching the Stephen Gray YouTube channel called Stephen Gray Vision, or you are listening to this on anchor.fm. And there is a purpose, as you might imagine, to these series of interviews I'm doing. I believe this is number 10 in the series that have been going on for about six months as we're getting into October 2020 now. And the purpose of this is just to help in whatever way we can by bringing forth voices who have some very important things to say about how we can heal and awaken as a species in this extremely important time. Many would talk, call this a time of great transition. So, uh, and for that reason, I have a wonderful person with me today who you can see on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, and I will first introduce him by reading his bio. But I also want to say, oh, okay, so his name is Chris Killam, and I also want to say that he will be speaking at the uh, first virtual and 10th uh, Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, which will be held online, as I say, on the weekend of October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Both Chris and his wife, Zoe Helene, have become family, essentially, and Chris is now in his fifth consecutive year participating in the conference. Um, and we've gotten into this routine where, we, where we, we call it something like a psychedelic sermon on Sunday morning, twisting that whole concept of a, of a church service into something really juicy. And uh, so Chris will be with us again this year. Uh, so now I'm going to read a short bio about Chris, and then we're just going to get right into it. Uh, Chris Killam is a medicine hunter, author, educator, and TV personality who promotes natural plant-based medicines, sustainable trade, and indigenous cultures. He has conducted ethnobotanical plant research in more than 45 countries and lectures worldwide about holistic wellness and botanical medicine. Chris helps to <clears throat> excuse me develop and popularize traditional medicine plant medicinal plants including ayahuasca, cannabis, San Pedro, kava, maca, rhodiola, ashwagandha, shisandra, tamanu oil, cat's claw, dragon's blood and hundreds of others. Um, this is part of a bio from the conference, actually, and the final uh, statement that I've left in from that one is that the New York Times has called Chris, quote, part David Attenborough, part India, Indiana Jones. And indeed, Chris has had a, a very adventurous life. Uh, I, when I say had, it's still lively and going on, and hopefully for <laughs> many more years. Um, I'm somewhat slowed down for the time being from the COVID situation, but with, uh, you know, God willing, as it were, um, that'll ease up and you know, Chris will be able to do his uh, world traveling again. Um, <clears throat> so again, welcome, Chris. Well, thank you, Stephen. I, I was afraid I was going to get a post-mortem there for a moment, but uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to be on with you today. And, you know, I always enjoy talking with you anyway, but it's good that we can share with other people and uh, expand the circle a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. And so, yeah, no, I'm delighted to be doing this with you and always enjoy hearing what you have to say about these matters. Uh, you are one of the more articulate people around about plant medicines, um, long experience communicating to people as an educator. And I also want to mention now, and hopefully I will again at the end of the interview, that uh, you have a new book coming out, uh, I believe in January, with Inner Traditions Park Street Press, which I have read since you asked me to do an endorsement for it. Uh, I've read the electronic version of it. We don't, there is no um, hard copy yet, uh, but it's a wonderful book. It really is. And I'm not saying that just because you're here and you know I'm trying to flatter oh, you or you. anything like that I really enjoyed it uh, um, as I said in the endorsement you have a very very clear way of communicating this kind of material and your uh, 50 years or more experience with yoga and being on the spiritual path uh, you know shines through beautifully in the book it's a it's a very useful book I think for people it's something you can take to the bank or well you know to the mat maybe um, well, well Thank you, Stephen. Uh, you know, when I first started writing The Lotus and the Bud, it, it really just seemed to me that after so much time uh, with a personal involvement with psychedelics and certainly with cannabis going back to the 60s uh, and with a long, deep daily practice of yoga, 
um, you know, I, I had accumulated so much understanding of the fusion of the two that it, it, and this also seems like the right time with the greater popularization of cannabis, the mm -hmm. greater freedoms that are, are uh, happening in so many states and so many different countries and, and the quite obvious uh, popularity of this fusion or what people like to refer to as lit yoga. So it, it's been a pleasure and I, and I am, I'm looking forward to it coming out. You know, I, I don't know if you do this when you have a new book come out, but I always, when I get the first copy in the mail, I sit down and I open it up and I read it. Uh, just because I'm so excited to have the physical <laughs> copy in my hands. Well, I don't know. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that with my my most recent book, Cannabis and Spirituality, because I think by that time I've read the damn thing so many times. I'm right. sort of like, you know, you've made that album and now you want to move on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, um, so yeah, that's great. And um, so yeah, let's get let's get let's start diving in here. And you've already alluded to the kinds of things I want to ask you about. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chris. Um, uh, and I would like to start with uh, this question. Uh, yoga has, well, statement first, but yoga, as you know, we, we all know, as you can't miss, you know, even if you're hiding in your kitchen, um, uh, is uh, damn near ubiquitous these days uh, in the Western world, you know, in the Americas and Europe and so on. Uh, you know, there's, there's almost more yoga teachers than there are students now. Uh, but I have my doubts about how deep the understanding of yoga is with many of these people and many of the students that go to these sessions um, or these classes or whatever. But you do. Um, you've dived in, you know, I think it's fair to say way deeper than most people have with this. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, um, the, yeah, so my question basically is, you know, what is yoga to you? I mean, what, what is the true definition of what yoga is? Well, uh, yoga, as far as I'm concerned, based on the experience that I've had practicing daily for 50 years, is a wisdom current that travels through humanity and uh, an aggregation of practices that originate out of India and Nepal and Tibet and China and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, meditative traditions and traditions of specific types of body movements and postures and breathing and meditations. And, um, you know, it's funny what you say about about people uh, not necessarily really representing, let's say, the fullness of yoga. We're all someplace on a continuum. You know that. And, and some people start out with an idea in mind that yogic uh, accomplishment or, or yogic attainment is sort of a gymnastic thing. Mm. But but what's true about yoga practice, and now I'm really talking, let's say, Hatha yoga, Ashtanga yoga, you know, the, the yoga practices that involve a lot of different postures and, and physical, you know, methods, is that by their nature, those methods also excite the nervous system and open up energetic channels in such a manner that People who practice them will have experiences regardless whether they've been sort of given the really juicy, full-on body, mind, spirit, you know, all is one download or not. I, I think it's fair to say that if a, uh, if a yoga teacher has a great apprehension of uh, the richness of what this energy is in yoga practice and and what it means in terms of the fulfillment of who we are as a human being clearly all's the better um, but there are teachers and practitioners on you know kind of every place in the arc from knowing absolutely nothing to being you know totally absorbed in in cosmic consciousness mm -hmm. and everything in between so I, I just accept that as part of the landscape and hope that there are enough people out there with good rich thoughtful intelligent humane kind wise messages to uh really sort of keep keep the the goodness of this percolating as this current moves through human history 
Well, that's a pretty generous attitude, Chris. Thank you. Um, sort of, it's all good and it's all working toward. It reminds me of um, you know, since you know Chugim Trungpa um, a little bit um, and like what his what he what he taught. Uh, to, uh, his his attitude was, you kind of start with a large pasture and you give them lots of room to move around and fall and stumble and things like that, and then you gradually reel them in, as it were. You know, um, mm. you don't you don't start by uh, you know he didn't come in heavy handed from Asia and superimpose a traditional approach to Buddhism. He right. kind of just sat there and watched for a while. You know, he watched a, I think he watched a week of TV when he first got over here, and then <laughs> and then he, he watched he listened to a couple of days of rock and roll and pronounced it a waste of time <laughs> uh, <laughs> that kind of thing tried lsd tried pod all those things he just wanted to know what everybody was up to and then gradually reeled him in so again it's a little bit of a distraction but i want to thank you for that generous attitude so let's go um you know let's go further in here because it's the title of the book is the lotus and the bud right lotus referring right. in general to yoga and the awakening process in that regard and the bud of course to cannabis right. so um could could you just extemporize for a while on uh, the connection between the two? Uh, maybe even if you care to, it's up to you. You know, uh, historically or how they how oh. they have intertwined. But but particularly for the benefit of people now, um, how they work together. Why why this title? Well well sure, Stephen. Um, I'll start with mythology, uh, if you will. Um, in the um, in the Hindu tradition, in the Vedic tradition, the god Shiva, uh, who's also known as the destroyer, um, <laughs> who's, who's a very unusual, profoundly powerful, very diverse god. I mean, simultaneously solemn and holy and crazy and wild, um, is the originator of both yoga and also um, he was, was responsible for bestowing ganja or cannabis upon humanity. That's the idea, is that these twin things both uh, intended to help humanity to experience greater sense of self, unity, uh, greater happiness, all of that originated from Shiva. So as a twin current of uh, forces that can benefit people, um, yoga and cannabis, at least theoretically by, by some people's understanding, originated from the same source. And in fact, if you consider the yogic tradition, which did emerge from Asia, and you consider the, the known um, origin of cannabis, the oldest pollen we have for cannabis goes back uh, 19 and a half million years to the uh, mm. Tibetan uh, plateau. So basically in the same area, we, we derive these wisdom teachings and also this plant. And both of them have spread all over the world. And, um, you know, yoga enhances pretty much every body system in terms of what it does for us physically. And cannabis also feeds what's known as our endocannabinoid system, which is an entire integrated uh, group of receptors throughout our entire bodies and brains that receive the cannabinoids, the active psychoactive components in cannabis and help to harmonize all of the body systems with each other. So cardiovascular activity with neurological activity with immune activity and on and on and on and bone development and everything you can think of. So basically, these two things are by nature integrating in different ways. And uh, it is the case, uh, and, I, and I know you know this, that in antiquity up to the present in Asia and especially in parts of India and particularly in the Himalayan region, you have a tradition of yoga and uh, cannabis as a fusion as something that it, that is part and parcel of you know you go to what you go to a shiva temple in the indian himalaya and there will invariably be at least one cannabis plant growing outside maybe a cannabis plant painted on a wall uh and in the course of being there you're likely to be offered um hashish 
to sit and contemplate Shiva. So mm. driving, deriving from this tradition, I thought, well, why not really explain to people how this can be beneficial in practice, not as the entirety of a person's practice, not as the only way they practice yoga, um, and, and to also understand, I believe for the first time in a book, um, what's actually going on neurologically and uh, energetically and also bringing in the uh, more of a shamanic understanding, if you will, of plant spirit and how the actual essential nature of cannabis itself or the spirit of cannabis itself also makes a contribution to this whole fusion. So that's kind of the basics of the lotus and the bud. Yeah, wonderful. Um, well, I think I had about six questions from what you just said, but let me just right. try, try this one on you. Um, what's your understanding of the plant spirit aspect of it? I mean, some people have, I've heard some people say they've actually encountered a visual representation of the green lady or something like that. Um, um, uh, most of us, I don't think, including myself, have had any direct contact with anything we would identify as a spirit or an entity that way. Um, do you know the story, by the way, um, uh, as a lead into uh, your response to this, um, uh, of uh, Padrino Sebastiao from the Santo Daime, that, uh, uh, you know, that certain strains or lineages of the Santo Daime uh, do quite uh, like that plant as a sacred plant. They called it right. Santa Maria, right? Right. Uh, and the, the, uh, I don't want to hog the time here because I'm here to interview you, not me. But, uh, but um, the story I'll say super briefly is that... Uh, uh, somebody brought it to his encampment back in the 70s, brought some weed, cannabis, and he didn't know about it apparently or didn't, wasn't familiar with the plant at that point, tried it out and had a vision where he found himself in a garden and a woman was there tending the garden and she said, oh yes, that plant you just smoked, that's my plant. And, uh, <laughs> and I would like, as a leader of a community, I would like to task you with the responsibility of um, taking that plant back from misunderstanding and misuse and uh, uh, giving it back to its proper owner, i.e. me, Santa Maria, also Pachamama. Yeah. So right. I'm just wondering, you know, have you had personal experiences, for example, where you would say there was a, there was a spirit of some sort present? Well, uh, for, first, let me give you a little quote. You know, La, Lama Kazi Dawa Samdap, who uh, was... He was responsible for one of the translations of Tibetan yoga, um, said, circumstances arise from a concatenation of causes, meaning, you know, like what's happening right now actually is a bubbling up from millions and maybe trillions of interactions in our lives that add up to this moment. And, and so that's all by way of saying that how some people may have, let's see, a, a vision of a green goddess Mm -hmm. and some others may have something else. I think a lot of that has to do with the zillions of ways that our minds and imaginations are individually put together. Um, what I have, I have, um, <coughs> excuse me, I have personally called upon uh, the spirit of cannabis and I have asked at different times to be let in to that field that you know in, in into the interior of the spirit if you will and um i've had some uh, what i would describe as gigantic experiences not mm -hmm. with a form of any particular kind not with any discernible goddess or uh visual spirit being as much as a vastness that I understood to my myself to be, you know, not that far into it, uh, if if it if if it sort of had location, and um, being completely gobsmacked by the immensity of this spirit. So, I'd say that our our ways of experiencing the spirit of cannabis or another plant are, are very different one from another. But yeah, for sure, I have had that and. Mm -hmm. I'm quite convinced that this spirit is massive and that that's demonstrated in the vast popularity, uh, you know, that, that cannabis enjoys all over the world and the really uh, powerful enthusiasm that people have for this plant. 
you know, we're not talking Sanka coffee here. We're, <laughs> t- we're talking something that, you know, in the worst of times, in the most illegal of places, you know, many or any or all of us have just persevered with this plant because of its, its lure and its allure. Deeply intertwined, I would say. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if we can, if you don't mind, I would like to get a little more into the kind of the, 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 the gist uh, or you know, the details in a way of, of, you know, how these two uh, um, practices, you could say, work together. Like, sure. you know, I, there, I could have several questions or I could just, you know, leave it over to you. But, you know, for example, you um, you're going to do your hatha yoga practices or whatever, and then you have a puff or whatever. What are the, some of the mechanics of that um, okay. dosage, or how does that work? And then what does it do for the layperson from a layperson's perspective? Somebody who's not really interested in knowing much about the endocannabinoid system or the neurological <laughs> you know nuances, but uh, just like if I'm going to include it in my yoga practice, what 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 can I expect might might happen that would be beneficial. All right, all right. I, I, I think um, two things from a uh, mental and spiritual standpoint, if you will, uh, but also uh, very much from a physical sensation standpoint. When I, um, and, I'll, and I'll get to that, the specifics of the how-to, but when I put these two together, there is an amplification of my experience of energy, of experience of sensation throughout my body, and also a greater sense of expansion uh, and, and somewhat of a reduction of pain. I mean, I've got dings and dents and injuries from decades of, you know, falling off mountains and stuff, you know, out of the trails. So um, I like that pain reduction. Uh, what I typically will do is, uh, you know, I, I still do admittedly smoke this stuff more than I do anything else. Um, so I'll have a hit in a pipe, let's say, in the morning, and then I'll do my yoga practice. And uh, my practice goes on for, uh, you know, these days uh, about two hours. Oh. And during that time, I'm in different postures, uh, I'm doing different moving exercises, I'm breathing, and as I am, there is unquestionably an enhanced sense of uh, expansion. And, and here's the thing about uh, this whole idea of expansion, of an expanded state. Uh, you know, and we certainly hear a lot about this at Spirit plant medicine that all of us due to physical and and emotional and and mental habits have uh, neurological pathways neural pathways grooves if you will in our brains that are well trod we react in certain ways to certain things and we also know that when we engage in the uh, you know thoughtful use or even the not thoughtful use for that matter of psychedelics and other things that those neural pathways are temporarily suspended and we have uh, a, a spontaneous arising of hundreds of new pathways. We see that with mushrooms especially in some of the, the neuroimaging that, that has been done. Um, I maintain that that happens with cannabis, with yoga practice, that this sense of expansion also is a letting go or a natural, uh, greatly aided dissolution of habitual thought and response. And um, it just creates an opportunity for, you know, richer and other options uh, in, in all respects. So from a pain reduction standpoint, if a person experiences pain in yoga practice, uh, from the standpoint of dissolving well-worn mental grooves in practice and having more of a sense of, of oneness with all things, uh, you know, actually feeling the energy in different places in the body when you pay attention to those places. These are all things that can happen with the thoughtful combination of uh, cannabis and yoga. I don't think it's a wise idea for people to get just hopelessly wrecked and, <laughs> and then do yoga, you know, like whatever, dab for a half hour or something. But that's not, that's not it. 
it's not about being just so smacked, you know, you're just out there. Um, having, you know, just like the expression, which is true, is the difference between a medicine and a poison is the dose. Uh, the difference between something that is useful and beneficial and, and, and helps in yoga practice and something that just basically makes a mess of your yoga practice is also the dose. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you, you can drink, uh, you know, I mean, I make a, an awesome cannabis chai. You could do that instead. You could have a little piece of a cookie or a brownie or something, you know, whatever you would prefer to um, kind of get your cannabis engine going for yoga practice. But really the idea is a greater amplification of energy and sensation and a, a greater sense of personal expansion. Mm, well said. So um, a question that comes up for me about that <clears throat> uh, last you know, uh, monologue that you just gave there is, um, l let me start the question this way. You, you're familiar with Houston Smith, and mm -hmm. um, uh, he has made a couple of comments uh, regarding psychedelics that I would like to toss out. Uh, one of them, I'm, I'm not sure if I have the exact words, but close enough to serve. Uh, one, of the, one of them is that it's something with the effect that it's clear that psychedelics can produce, uh, I don't know if you use the word religious or spiritual experiences, it's much less clear or less clear that they can produce religious lives or spiritual lives. That's one thing. And then the other one is that uh, it was, I guess, kind of a caution where he said, what, what we really want to emphasize here, or what's really important is spiritual traits over spiritual states. And so my question then is, uh, you know, how how... How does it need to work? I mean, of course, you know, you have this expansive, generous attitude, you know, toward, you know, the many ways to come at things. Um, and I appreciate that. But in a maybe general sense, how how does it work to integrate the, you know, into the long term? How does it, you know, like if you're having spiritual state experiences, how do they ground back into your daily walk? I mean, do you have to do two hours of yoga with cannabis every day, for example? And and then even then you still have another 12 hours every day that um, you're either, you know, coming down off it or down off it or tired or whatever. And, you know, you have to deal with yourself and your world in this, quote, straight version, well, right? Well, First of all, I, I um, as you know from reading my book, doing two hours of yoga per day is a great reduction for me where I started. I was doing six to eight hours of yoga a day for years. And that was insane, frankly. That was fanatical beyond fanatical. Um, but, you know, I, I've chosen, and, and I'll, I'll directly answer your question. I've chosen to practice a lot of yoga and to meditate daily um, because, you know, this is something that I want to be able to embody and, and hopefully in good positive ways exemplify and, uh, and, and to be a resource for other people. I mean, you know, I've taught thousands of people in yoga. Um, but at the, at the same time, I agree with Houston Smith, you know, uh, if you have spiritual visions, if you go into spiritual states in the psychedelic experience, um, you know, at that time, let's say you're suffused with the, you know, the awe of God or whatever it is that happens to you, he's absolutely correct that that does not necessarily translate at all into a life that's, say, better led as a result. And, and, and I think if we've learned anything as, uh, especially in the ayahuasca scene, which I've been around for a good long time now, um, it is insufficient to a great extent to just go down <clears throat> and sit in an ayahuasca ceremony. I'm not saying that people can't get through some Rem so through some traumas and and have remarkable healing experiences but the whole idea you know if you have an experience that um we really are thoroughly interdependent and that we really do need to be more caring and on and on and on and on and and what that experience is like when you're in this hyper amplified psychedelic state then then remembering that, writing it down, talking it through, and then living those understandings and principles, that's the part 
that Houston Smith's talking about. And I think that, um, you know, that's the integration part, if you will. Uh, and, and I don't think that everybody who's engaged with psychedelics, I don't think everybody that's engaged with cannabis uh, necessarily does that. Not that they have an obligation to, but it's the actual behavior the actual, okay, now how do I go about my day that makes the difference? And, and, and to your question, uh, you know, I think of my grandmother. I mean, she never did 20 seconds of yoga in her life, and she was one of the most spectacularly spiritual and loving human beings I've ever met. So I don't think it, <laughs> it's even necessary um, to have a particular articulated practice. It, it you know... I, I mean, it's really how you choose to live, how you consciously go about doing your life mm -hmm. that, that shows whether you've, you know, carried the vision forward, carrying the medicine, as we like to say, or not. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, in this general line of thinking here, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, cannabis, uh, I think you'd agree, uh, although I wouldn't put it on the plant, but it's been called seductive. Um, uh -huh. It's more like we're the seductee uh, in that sense. Uh, but you know, if, if if you're a person who resonates with cannabis, if you like what it does, even 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 though that may not be necessarily the best thing you can be doing, in terms of say maybe you're putting a shine on things and you're not dealing with the real stuff in your life. Um, so I guess the question you know is that. Uh, how is is there a danger, and how prevalent would you think that actually is in the culture, to be over dependent on cannabis in your life? Oh, oh, I think I think that's a real thing, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, when you consider the world in which we live uh, and the pressures that are on us, um, you know, people do turn to cannabis for relief. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a big, big factor. And it may be relief of uh, pain. It may be relief of trauma. It may be relief of stress. It may be just a temporary, I need to get the heck out of here kind of relief. Um, but the world itself for, you know, probably everybody, but certainly for those who aren't the absolute hyper privileged, which is almost everybody, is a pressure cooker. And so when you consider what are the things that we can do to help to mitigate that pressure, mitigate that stress, uh, employing cannabis is certainly one of them. And at least there are known physiological benefits and advantages. But yes, of course, it can absolutely be outdone. Uh, my wife Zoe and I went to uh, a wedding in Colorado a few years ago. I actually mm -hmm. uh, officiated at the wedding. and. It was, uh, you know, even though I had partied in amazing places from the 60s on, I had personally never seen anything like the consumption that went on there for three days. It was, it was mind boggling. It was, it was Olympic. <laughs> and um, I mean, people showed up with valises full of jars of ganja and hundreds and hundreds of joints in planters all around this sprawling place where this wedding took place. And, you know, there, there really wasn't any left when it was over. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's no question you can overdo it. Um, it's better, I believe, to overdo cannabis than to overdo alcohol. Uh, I mean, okay, at least yeah. cannabis isn't a neurotoxin, but sure, sure. You know, I mean, we have to take care with everything, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to lead you into some of the more perhaps esoteric spiritual territory that you've addressed here and there in your, in your book. There's a lot of wonderful quotes from people, for example, including yourself, but uh, you've also, you know, spent time around some pretty amazing people and then quoted, you know, people you've, uh, you've um, talked to, uh, I mean, you've read about as well. And uh, so one of them was that kind of struck me, uh, uh, I think I, I think I kind of know this one. Uh, more or less, but uh, I just thought I'd like to hear your comment on it. It's uh, it's from the Kena Upanishad that you uh, referenced in your yep. book, and um, uh, uh, it said something like, um, you know, the, the importance of having no knowledge, <laughs> which I thought was a really interesting way to put it. You know, so what does what does it mean to have no knowledge? Why is that good? Well, well, 
what it doesn't mean is that you abandon everything you know. I mean, you know to keep yourself safe, you know to keep yourself clothed, you know, it, certain things. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are kind of innate intrinsic knowledges, but the whole idea is that if you're actually going to contemplate the vastness of the infinite and be absorbed into something beyond the the sense of personal self, then letting go of what you know, uh, suspending all of that and just being open to the forces of creation as they flow is the way to go. It, it's similar to that other quote that basically says, uh, think not, reflect not, not, meditate not, reside in the natural state. That was that um, was going to be my next question. Okay. Got, yeah. Yeah. Got it yeah. in my notes. What does meditate not mean? <laughs> right. 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 Well, you know, it, this is a this is a funny thing. I mean, I, I read virtually I think every Krishnamurti book back in the seventies, and also went to see him hmm. speak in the uh, Oak Grove in Ojai a couple of times. And he was a remarkable human being and brilliant. And his. Uh, his way of composing language was extraordinarily insightful. And he basically, his whole attitude was just stop this nonsense and be fully aware right now, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and nobody actually did that. Nobody actually did that thing. Um, but that was his premise. And, and I think for all of the rest of us, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the form, if you will, leads to the formless, mm -hmm. the process of meditation, the process of deep and profound breathing in, uh, let's say, an asana that opens your spinal energies way up, uh, just kind of ratchets up the electricity in your brain and helps to open up a whole bunch of more channels. Uh, it, it is the case that these methods lead to the method free to the you know at least you know at least in theory and according to some of the people who've crossed that threshold you know okay then you don't have to do anything then you don't have to meditate then it doesn't really matter whether you're a vegan or you're eating wings at night you know it's really <laughs> it's really all the same um but for those of us who have not accomplished that then these methods are highly valuable for giving us the strength, the energy, the endurance, the stamina, the electricity, you know, the, the, the inner gasoline, if you will, to keep going and, and to keep opening ourselves up to the extent that we can. Wonderful, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that brings up a question uh, about how cannabis works for a lot of people because as an amplifier uh you know and as martin a lee called it a vasodilator um he and other people write uh, under the influence of cannabis so it stimulates creative thought obviously right, right. but it, um uh you know what we're talking about here is no mind or no knowledge or no meditation um uh, as being i would think you would agree with me the ultimate gateway into wisdom or to awakening is that you know you have to get yourself out of the way so um what would you say to people that that uh are trying to work with cannabis in a meditative way that way but they just find it just makes their minds busier well it, no, there is no thing that is for everybody mm. <laughs> okay i mean except breathing there's just <laughs> no thing that's for everyone so um i respect that i understand that i mean i i have i've known people i've been close to who you know they won't go near cannabis because it gives them this frightening, all enveloping sense of paranoia that they mm -hmm. just cannot stop. And okay, so whatever is happening, whatever neurological cascade or, or whatever is going on in them, um, it's, it's clearly not suitable for them. So I, I don't think that everybody is right for cannabis, just as, you know, I, I don't think everybody is right for psychedelics mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the way cannabis in a large amount especially orally consumed is a class a full-on astonishing visual psychedelic too mm -hmm. um, but you know it, it's the your results may vary if you if you 
try it and you find that it makes your mind too busy, if you find that it makes you uncomfortable, if it doesn't help to deliver you to what you want, don't do it. Yeah. Well, in my book, I, I, I talk about the, you know, the importance of dosage and mm -hmm. uh, I would say to those people, and maybe your advice is, you know, better, I don't know, but, um, uh, start really really small and see you know what at what dosage you can stay present with and then maybe you can work up over time you know although that certainly is not the guideline that we follow at the uh cannabis evening at spirit plant medicine it's a <laughs> it's a fury it's a furious festival out there of of total overindulgence before going back to the ceremony so yeah i mean i'm with you on that um, yeah. in principle but i'm also kind of poking a little at, at how we actually do it when we get together indeed yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I i pulled out a couple of quotes from you actually from the book that uh, i was hoping you could comment on because you've spoken you spoke a bunch about kundalini and mm -hmm. the, it seemed the, the kundalini energy seems to be an important component of of this whole work in some ways you know um and so here's one of them uh, this is a Chris Killam quote from the book. Kundalini is nothing less than the primordial energy that enlivens us and is the seat of all genius. Can you explain? The Kundalini energy, well, you know how I was talking about yoga as a wisdom current that goes mm. through all of humanity. Yeah. That wisdom current within us is Kundalini. And Kundalini basically from the base of the spine to the top of the head lights up our nervous system and gets more energy going. And it is the aim. The aim is kind of a funny thing to say in a way with yoga, because the idea of yoga really at the end is to have no aim at all. <laughs> but um, the, one of the fundamental purposes of yoga practice, especially meditation and breathing and asana and kriyas and, and different things is to open up our energy channels and specifically get the kundalini energy going very strongly up the spine uh and that in itself leads to phenomenal spiritual awakening so i do uh i do talk in the lotus in the bud about um working with kundalini and i have had personally you know i don't i don't give advice uh if i haven't done the thing i'm advising because that just seems like insanely inauthentic mm -hmm. and how could i possibly know one way or another um you know but i have had some of and certainly not all of but some of the most profound kundalini experiences of my life with the aid of cannabis and um so you know having the having the central energetic channel of the spine open way up having this profoundly powerful force come up uh and and going into uh a brilliant visionary state that is something that is possible with cannabis and yoga and um you know i again i think that people should have at least as much yoga practice without cannabis as they do with it certainly i know i had thousands of hours of practice before i i ever put the two together mm -hmm. um but but i also think that um you know these things are all helpful i yeah. traditions Excuse me. I meant to take this phone out of the room. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Got to put you it know. on silent or something. Ach. Well, my wife not, might, might not get the call in question here. <laughs> you know, what we call traditions, our stuff is basically what pe some people figured out a while ago. Okay? And it may have been brilliantly intentional and all of that. And we're figuring out things now, too. I mean, we've taken yoga on in ways that are utterly different than the monastic ways that yoga was practiced in, in mm -hmm. you know, recondite spots around the world and, and have taken it into busy, modern, I have to drive to work at eight kind of lives. Uh, and so also engaging with psychedelics on occasion, uh, also utilizing cannabis. Uh, these are 
our modern syncretic additions and, and shaping and reshaping of practice as people have always done throughout all of time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're probably getting close to about an hour. I like to try to keep these things around about an hour. Um, so uh, I'd like to ask you an impossible question now, but y you may have something to say about this. I, I, I'll I, give you an impossible answer. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, uh, Chungam Trungpa had a book called Journey Without Goal. So, you know, I understand that principle in principle. Right. Um, and, and actually, isn't there... Um, uh, I think the way he presented it, I don't know if other people present it the same way, the 10 ox herding pictures and supposedly the these wood carvings and supposedly the last one is something like, thus ends the journey that never need have taken place in the first place or something wow. like that. Yeah, like you come back to just realizing, oh, it's just right now, nothing else going on, ordinary magic, right? Right, right, yeah. right. Anyway, so the, the the difficult to answer question uh, uh, that I have been asking people in this series just to see what their take on it is, uh, um, is, you know, we're obviously in a challenging time right now. Uh, people in the spiritual communities and the psychedelic communities, uh, uh, some of them anyway, and also some of the people from the indigenous traditions, such as uh, Rocio Alarcón that I interviewed recently, um, who's going to be speaking at the conference, and also Nan Shuni Giron, both of who came to me courtesy of your wife's Cosmic Sister program, by the way. Um, uh, they, uh, the, okay, there's so many different ways to talk about it, but uh, one way of talking about it is that, uh, okay, let's, let's use Chris Beige. You know, in his book, LSD and in the Mind of the Universe, he said that in the later part of this 20-year journey with these high-dose LSD sessions that he did, he was starting to get the message from, I think he calls them the vast intelligences of the universe, that there almost certainly will be a great awakening on this planet, but that it will have to be preceded by a great death. So much will have to fall away. So, um, you know, of the various people I've talked to on this series so far, most of them agree with that. They, that's kind of the vision that they're picking up themselves. Some of them are less optimistic that we're going to get through you know, this, you know, difficult transition, um, and they're just sort of seeing the dark clouds. In fact, Rocio Alarcón, even though I think she, uh, her whole life is committed to supporting that vision of how humanity can get back on track and straighten up and fly right again, but um, she told me that uh, uh, some she and some people were I think it was an, an ayahuasca ceremony they were doing and they all had the same vision of a very black black cloud and they interpreted that as that that's what's coming and then she said that she then remembered that one of the old curanderos or perhaps curanderas from about four forty years ago had had that same vision but had projected it into the our time so I'm just wondering you know what your your corns are telling you about what's going on right now uh you know and just what's going on and you know where we're going well we clearly are already in, you know uh, we are already in an apocalypse mm. i mean it's not like in the future this could happen you know, you go to uh, Shanghai and you go out for a walk along the waterfront of the river at night and there are millions and millions of people and it's like trying to shoulder your way through a Manchester soccer game. You get how desperate and crazy and messed up and out of control things really are all over the place, you know. Um, with COVID-19, with the savage destruction of the natural environment globally, with the savage loss of wildlife of all different types, with the crushing, devastating disappearance of biodiversity, with wars and famine and as many as 1.3 billion people moving out of now almost uninhabitably hot areas of Central Africa, for example. I mean, this thing is fully upon us. Um, you know, we're, we don't have to wait for any other event to say, yeah, see, you know, the prophecies are coming true. I mean, this is happening now. We are in the time that people talk about. And so, you know, I, I mean, I, I always just 
can't stand it when people say, oh, and it's all wonderful and it's all spiritual. It is not wonderful and it is not all spiritual. People are suffering like crazy. People are dying. Animals are dying. Forests are dying. Reefs are dying. The oceans are polluted and on and on and on and on. Storms are greater. The fires are more, etc. cetera. Um, we have no guarantee that we're going to be among the people who actually survive or, or do better. We don't know that. We don't know how long this goes. But I do think that um, the urgency and the intensity of everything that is happening is pushing us to answer questions within ourselves and to, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to practice meditation. It's one thing to do engage in spiritual uh, pursuits when everything is rosy when it's a beautiful sunny day, when there's a warm breeze off the coast, when the waves are nice, when the fruit is ripe, when the music's sweet, when you really don't have a care in the world, that's easy. You know, it's hard as hell when it's basically raining great big flaming balls of wet baby shit down on mm -hmm. you, which is what's happening now. So I, I would say, yes, I agree. The big bad black cloud is already over us and absolutely hideous, horrible things are happening that cannot be reversed, cannot. They can be mitigated, they can be you know, curbed somehow, but we've already done devastating damage to about 60% of the ecosystems in the world. Um, but at the same time, I do agree that this is forcing us to, to rally to some extent. And it is extremely stressful and it's very difficult for people. And, you know, there are very few people who are unscathed by this. Certainly nobody I know. Um, but I do also agree that the pressure of this is causing many of us uh, to dive more deeply into our practice, not only as a refuge, but also as a wellspring of energy and inspiration and vision so that we can carry on the behaviors that we want to carry on being fundamentally good well-intentioned thoughtful helpful serving people in an environment that is dismally messed up <laughs> well that's, that's both... what i think is happening that's that's the light and the dark all in one little nutshell there chris yeah um <clears throat> Yeah, so maybe, uh, you know, thank you for that stark but clear and, and actually, uh, you know, the hopefulness shines through there too, you know, and I think that's that's something that I've been paying a lot of attention to lately is, you know, the old statement, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and then there's another one I like to quote by Victor uh, Hugo or... Ugo, I don't know what language you pronounce that in, um, who said something like, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Right. And then you throw in Leonard Cohen's, uh, you know, there's a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in. I think, I think that's the most hopeful vision or view to take these days that is that... Um, uh, you know, well, I'll come back to my old teacher, Chögyam Trungpa, you know, that the, the, the ground of everything is basic goodness. And, uh, right. you know, when when push comes to shove, when it's when it's life, you know, life or death, uh, I think we're going to see and we already are, but increasingly an amazing amount of creative thinking and manifestation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think we're already seeing astonishing and just heartbreaking service on on the form of a, in the form of a lot of people for example who are healthcare workers who basically abandoned their lives to serve others you know in, in this particular time of need and and you know it's remarkable i mean you know i'm not doing that i i don't i don't have that particular circumstance but i admire the heck out of it and mm -hmm. i think that you know if we can, um, I mean, we don't know, we really don't know how many of us it takes, how long being more aware and trying to live by good, you know, fundamentally good principles, how many it really takes to tip things, to tip the balance in that direction. But we do know that nothing will happen if we don't make a, a real effort. And so that's what I think 
is the is the kind of the bright um the bright promise you know we have to carry that banner basically into battle Mm, yeah and and you know hence i think where the you know your book is uh, is potentially very useful for people because you know one simple way of you know bringing it down to a, a, a nutshell as it were is uh, you would remember this uh, quote better than I do from the book I didn't write it down but it's something like that a spiritual warrior when there's a giant wave coming learns to ride the crest right? yeah a warrior does not bow to a gale he rides upon its crest yeah and I think right. that's uh, something that we should all be putting on our walls you know and a you know, <laughs> in on our bathroom mirrors, and you know. Yeah, it's time to put on our all-terrain tires, folks. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, on that cheery note, uh, um, I'd like to wrap this up. Unless you have anything else you dearly want to say at this point. No, you know, I I, I really appreciate this time, Stephen. I mean, I, you know, I I've liked you since I ever first met you, and I I think you're very thoughtful in in how you consider different things. I like your questions. It's a pleasure to be on. And you know, this this kind of communication, I believe, is one of the many things that we really need now mm -hmm. um, to spread the word as much as we can, to encourage each other as much as we can. Uh, to express hope when it's not completely, you know, baseless and, and hopelessly unfounded, you know, but, but, but just to be this. So, so thank you so much for having me on. It, it's really been quite wonderful. Well, it's, that feeling is definitely mutual, Chris. And uh, I would also like to um, mention again that you and your wife, uh, along with uh, about 30 other amazing people, are going to be speaking at our virtual Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. And uh, if you are watching or listening to this, uh, you can get an 11% discount on the ticket for, there's two or three levels of tickets, but 11% on whichever level you choose uh, by using the um, discount code KILLAM2020, and that's spell, spelled K-I-L-H-A-M, and then the numbers 2020. And um, also, I get, want to remind people again about your book coming out in January, correct? Yep, the Lotus and the Bud. It'll be published by Park Street Press, and you can yeah. already you can pre-order if you're just that excited about it. You can pre-order now on both Barnes and Noble and also Amazon.com. Uh, so that's uh, the Lotus and the Bud. Yeah, and folks. I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here with Chris Killam and I want him to think that I like him or something like that. This is an excellent book. And when I say excellent, not only is it beautifully written, it's very clearly communicated, it's based on experience, and it's ready to go, ready to use information that you can take to your mat and to your pipe. <laughs> um, and uh, and That is like right out of a New York ad agency. Take it to your mat, take it to your pipe. I like it. I like it. Good. And um, so uh, any links that I can put on tabs for yeah. that people can yeah. check out? Uh, MedicineHunter.com is sort of the fountainhead, and that'll get you to all of the other uh, various propaganda sites that I post on my Facebook mm -hmm. and link LinkedIn and, and other pages. But MedicineHunter.com will uh, get you started there. I'm also on Instagram. Okay, yeah, and you, you have you've written some other books. I I haven't read any of the other books, but um, uh, having read this one now, I suspect if I were to read the Ayahuasca te Test Pilot's Handbook, I, I would probably find that quite uh, quite a lovely book as well. Well, the Ayahuasca Test Pilot's Handbook is exactly that. It's a real handbook that gives you the who, what, where, when, how, why, you know, how it works, kind of basics of ayahuasca. Um, and and uh, really is intended to be something that, you know, if you're if you're interested in ayahuasca or if you're new and you got lots of questions, or for that matter, if you're not new and you got lots of questions, um, the ayahuasca test pilots handbook should help you with that. 
Great. And, oh, I should say that that conference, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference that Chris and uh, Zoe and many others are going to be part of is on the weekend again of tw uh, October 23rd, 24th, and 25th. And it's going to be really exciting. Um, we're going to be working with a, with a very professional studio. My co-organizing partner Mark and I are going to be at that studio for three days uh, eating takeout food and all that. Um, <laughs> so, again, thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Stephen. Bless you, and uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing, absolutely.